Chapter 7 Centerland Sparse patches of moonlight lit the way through the gloom, and they managed to avoid any unpleasant encounters. But at each whisper of leaves and each creak of old wood, Turm rested his hand on the hilt of his sword, ready for the Pale Ones to reveal themselves at any moment. They walked all night, stopping only for two brief moments of rest. Minikin checked their surroundings regularly, ensuring they still traveled toward the road. His feet were sure, and he showed no signs of weariness or fear of pursuit. He led them north, making few turns save when they came to a cleft in the land. Then they traveled east a short ways before coming out again and continuing their course. Turm wasn't overly exhausted. Still, he remembered his squire's training again, as if the burning in his lungs had been merely sleeping all these years. As dawn broke, they left the trees and stepped through another small ditch. At last, they'd come upon a well-worn path. It might even be considered a road. Wagons and horses had obviously traveled its surface many times, wearing it flat in parts and rutted in others. As they stumbled on a signpost marked Robin's Road, Turm gained confidence. Let's rest here a moment, he said as they stopped. We should probably look after your dressings. He reached for his flask once more and took a long draft. Minikin sat at the side of the road along the higher ridges of grass embankment. Pushing his gi aside, he touched the bandage underneath. Blood had dried. The wound appeared to be healing. The ninja reached into a pouch to remove a vial of herbs. Turm had noticed Minikin digging in the brush for something several times along their journey, but hadn't seen what it was yet. The Kithkin withdrew several pieces of root and placed the vial back in the bag. What do you have there? Minikin didn't look up. Shade thorn root. It accelerates the body's healing for a short while, though it gives quite a headache. If I'm hushed, it's because I'm focusing past the pain as we learn at the dojo. The sooner I heal, the better. The plant grows only here, on the island of Ease and on Ix, the island farther east. Sometimes we receive a delivery of it, but it's always odd and dried, and comes in small quantities. This is as fresh as I've seen it. Turim nodded. Minikin looked down and shook his head slowly. I have a feeling I was lured here. I thought I was coming to make peace with the Greywater clan, but I've seen no sign of them whatsoever. Greywater clan? asked Turim, glad the ninja was opening up. A centuries old driver clan, said Minikin, straightening his poncho and scabbard. What does that have to do with the Dark Elves? asked Turim. All I know is that we received a message from the Greywater clan to meet here, and immediately we were ambushed by the Dark Elf Assassins. And something seemed off with the seal on the letter also, and the message. It just doesn't feel right. My hope at peace blinded me to that fact though. That can't be a coincidence. I don't understand why, said Turum. Minikin looked up at him, then straight ahead as he rose. I'm not sure yet. Let's keep on. Suddenly, he stopped very still looking the direction they'd come as a deer that catches the sound of the hunter. Turm could hear it too. Horse hooves beat the road. Let's get off the lane, quick! Move into the brush. Why? Asked Manikin, puzzled look in his eyes. I won't delay here. It may be dark elves, replied Turm, stepping into the shrubbery. I'm concerned for our safety. He looked at Manikin with a frown and bent brow. But dark elves don't ride horses. Not these ones, anyway. Master Shadowstar, his term, growing impatient. That's beside the point. With clear reluctance, Minikin joined Turim in the tall brush just as the horses passed. Don't be afraid, whispered Minikin. Let's attack now. His hand was on his blade. He looked ready to leap. Turim put his hand forward to hold Minikin at ease. When the passerbys were far enough gone, he looked out. Then his jaw tightened. The device on the shield of the riders was a black dragon with its wings furled out, displayed over the top of a golden triangle of horns. Dark Knights, he whispered with a shudder of uncertainty. Why in the god's name are they here on Yees? Still, Minikin appeared puzzled, and perhaps a bit distraught. If they were Dark Knights, why didn't we ambush them? Turm shook his head, standing from their spot. There was no purpose in it. Let's hope we don't run into them in Centerland. It looks as though they're heading that direction. Minikin stepped down into the road. I understand. You do not yet want me to return my life debt to you. He laughed half-heartedly. Turm only smiled politely. 
It was ironic. Only a short time ago, he considered the lack of fear a quality, but clearly this was the reason he'd found Meineken surrounded and wholly outnumbered in the first place. More important now, though, were the Dark Knights they'd seen. What were they doing here? And then it hit him. The reason for all these suspicious disappearances of ships. The reason why nobody had heard from the Black Division in years. The wing they'd stopped was close to Genova. He suspected they were somewhere along the coastal countries, but maybe they were here in the Cornerian Isles. But why had no one noticed them? Where were they hiding? As they continued to perplex themselves with the issue, the road straightened. They saw a great village far off in the distance, blurred by the haze of morning mist. The visible portion of the wall stretched for miles, running east to west, before passing behind trees that veiled their view. Sharpened posts of wood formed its outer defense, and peaking just above their height, in the distance beyond the gates, stood tall buildings of sturdy pine. That's the place we've sought. Centeran, said Meineken softly, pointing ahead. I see it, replied Turum. Solid. It makes me feel as though it's a part of the island with its walls reaching so deep. They're like roots of a tree turned upwards. Meineken nodded and touched his shoulder gently, but his eyes blinked long and he let out a sigh. They kept moving, making their way north toward their destination. Early that afternoon, they entered the city's wooden gates beneath an arch where two poorly armed lookouts stood. Immediately, they were surrounded by lively folk walking to and fro. The citizens dressed as most on ease, in simple leather boots and light clothing of various greens and browns, every nuance of forest surrounding their fair town. The men and women smiled for the most part, stepping with levity. Term wondered if they had any idea what was going on out in the wilderness of ease. They would know if they'd been taken over by the Dragon Army already, right? He thought. He looked down the main avenue that ran through the city. On the left of the street was a bakery. Just opposite it, on the right, a cobbler's. The shops were quaint and jovial-looking places, with painted trim and goods displayed in their windows. The smells were delicious. Still, he didn't let his eyes falter in an attempt to spot signs of the Dark Knights he'd seen on the road. The chances of them being in the city now were far higher than not. Meineken led Turum past the mercantiles and further down the lane. Turning away from the main street, they strode on to a smaller, albeit just as lively, side avenue. At length, Turum saw what he assumed was the ninja's destination. A large pub with a sign that read, The Mint Hippogriff, swung from a sturdy wooden pole in front. It was two stories tall, standing some ways above the other wooden structures in its shadow. Outside the front entrance, several small steeds were tied to a post. The beasts seemed happy to be amidst such a lively crowd, and their eyes looked thoughtfully toward the pair as they approached. I've heard that many rebels come to this place, said Meineken, in a voice louder than term considered appropriate for such talk. People with no love and even deep hatred for the Dragon Army. We should find someone who can help us here, and no Dark Knights. I haven't been to Centerand in years, nor even to the island for that matter. But there's certainly some feeling here I've missed. The term could not see Meineken's face. His eyes showed the Kithkin smile beneath his dark hood. I sometimes used to sail with my father here to these islands, continued Meineken nostalgically. He was a fisherman and a tradesman. He used to sail his dried goods here in my youth on occasion. Ah, the fish of Tosokan, said Turum, properly distracted. I have good memories of it. The seafood! I managed to catch a nice sturgeon on my first day here, but it wasn't the same. Meineken made neither answer nor sign of congratulation. Seemingly lost in his thought, he sighed. I remember walking side by side with my father through the streets. The Dragon Wars took my father's life many years ago. He didn't leave to see me grow up, to become a ninja master of the Black Tarin. Durham put his hand on Meineken's shoulder. We've all lost folk dear to us in this war. Meineken glanced at him, turning the black iron handle. The heavy wooden door swung out and fell shut behind them as they stepped inside. The ceiling was high, with roof supports of thick beams and walls of sturdy log design. Along the back, windows set a few feet below the ceiling cast a warm glow into the pub. Sunlight radiated through pipe smoke and offered a general feeling of homely comfort amidst all the merriment, music, and voices. A girl clothed in light chiffon dress danced on a stage at the far side of the common area. 
Everyone in the pub, save a few being served pints of ale at the bar, watched as she moved. Some sort of traditional easy and dense term vaguely recognized. I suppose we should seat ourselves, said Durham. Meineken nodded as they watched several barkeeps and waitresses sweep past them with barely a nod. So it would seem. Durham strode forward and sat at one of the few empty tables. Meineken followed closely behind, barely hopping out of the way of a brisk stepping elf maiden. He slid into the seat before she ran him down. A young barmaid approached them and asked for their order. She wore a tan and simple dress, and over it lay an apron stained with various beverages and meals she'd delivered throughout the day. Or perhaps the week, Turim thought. They decided on two pints of ale and a small plate of Napa chips. The barmaid gave a curtsy, then stepped quickly to the bar to the right of the commons, where a gruff-looking older man served up many mugs of frothing drink. The barkeep's thinning widow's peak was somewhere between red and brown. After hearing various shouts for his name, they soon determined that he was called Critchard Songbird and that he owned the pub. Behind him, the copper taps of a line of kegs shone with a polished glimmer. After their first round, they ordered a basket of biscuits and two bowls of beef stew to ease their appetite. They hadn't eaten since the boar's meat at Dwelling Earth. When the dancer seemed to be performing her last dance, Turim leaned closer to Meineken. We should probably ask around. We need to try to find where we can get these griffins or birds, or whatever might work. Meineken nodded in agreement, but he continued eating his last few bites. Perhaps we might find someone who can guide us. I doubt we'll find any for sale. Guide us? You mean come along? Turim asked, not sure what else he'd expected. I hope that's not our only choice. Do you see anyone we can trust? Meineken glanced up, shifting his eyes from beneath his hood while Turim looked around at the other guests. Some gazes he caught looking back, but most patrons focused on the red-haired girl on stage. Not everyone in here is an open rebel, he thought. How do we tell a guide we're fleeing from the dragon army? Meineken leaned closer so they could lower their voices more. It's hard to say. Any of these folk could be worthy of the task. But with the assassins on our trail, the question is, who would we be willing to draw into peril with us? Turm's mouth turned in an easy smile and waited for one of the patrons to pass by. I'd hate to involve anyone, really. If we have no choice, it would be wise to question the barkeep himself. They're often willing to spout information they've overheard from tongues loosened by one too many pints. You're probably right. Let's ask, replied Meineken as he began to rise from his wooden chair. He pulled his dark poncho tighter around his shoulders. Then four shadows appeared at the doorway. Turm's eye caught them, and he rested his hand on his hilt as he recognized what they were. He paused. Music discordantly ended. The room quieted bit by bit as each of the occupants began to take notice of the interlopers. Dark Knights of the Black Division. At least one of them had been among the horsemen they'd seen along the road. Standing out amongst the locals, Turm and Meineken had surely been spotted already. They couldn't avoid that now. I hope the stories Meineken heard about the pub's occupants are true, he thought. He stood motionless with furrowed brow, remaining intent on the Dragon Army Knights. His body was taut like a bowstring ready to release. When Turim did glance over, the barkeep, Critchard, had a terrible scowl on his face at the sudden presence of the Dragon Army. He was probably just as surprised they were on the island as he was. Critchard shot glances at the dancer on stage, and the girl acknowledged with a nod. She waved and the music picked back up. Around the pub, some of the patrons let their hands fall to their weapons, their faces aghast at the arrival of the Dark Knights on their island, and what's more, in their pub. Eyeing turn, the Dark Knights called out to him, cutting the quiet tension at their arrival. Knight of the Hawk, they shouted gruffly. We require conference. You're wanted for questioning by order of General Panther Subsidium Fist, Grand General of the Black Dragon Army. The other Dark Knights immediately drew their swords and moved in through the door. Turim was certain their intent wasn't to question him, not until they'd gotten their fill of beatings laid on him first, as was probably the case with all their so-called suspects. He glanced at Meineken. They were definitely outnumbered. We're not hiding again, are we? Whispered Meineken. Turim frowned. Don't take another step into this place! He shouted. If your business is with me, and not with these fair folk, then you'll surely let me come outside before my apprehension. Turim saw Meineken out of the corner of his eye, but then... Sitting near the door where the Dark Knight stood, he saw a trio of familiar faces. Somehow, they'd slipped in recently. He did his best to contain his relief. But for a slight pause in their step, 
The Dark Knights didn't respond to Turim in the least. Now he knew there were more outside. One of the rangers, the quiet one, Streven, kicked out a leg. The Dark Knights in the lead tripped, sprawling with two more of his comrades landing atop him. They struck the dusty wooden floor with a loud crack of armor on wood, then armor on armor. My thanks, shouted Turim, turning to run. Just watch it after you, shouted Streven, louder than Turim had heard him speak. The ranger leapt from his chair, bolting from the door with Jaffreen and Tartar right behind. Turim heard shouting coming from the barkeep then. He couldn't make out what it was, but the dancer appeared to react to whatever it was the gruff voiced man had said. Turim approached the stage as the dancer motioned him to join her. He didn't want to put her in danger, so he hesitated. But when she began to swing her arm, waving him onward like a windmill in a storm, he decided he'd better. The ranger's escape was blocked. Apparently, Meineken had noticed too. He reached for his sash and with a quick flick of his wrist, he sent a throwing star zipping across the room. It embedded itself in the face of the Dark Knight's captain, standing in the doorway still, dropping him to the floor. The Dark Knight cursed, blood streaming from the darkness of his helm. Only then did Meineken dart after Turim. The Rangers of Ease raced out the doors, pushing their way past the remaining Dark Knight, forcing him roughly to the ground. The Dark Knights couldn't have known it, but they'd clearly chosen one of the worst places in all of Centerland to accost Turim. Now, several of the other occupants of the pub rose to confront the Dark Knights with weapons drawn. Smoke began to billow out onto the stage as Turim clambered up. The music that had started up again came to a close. Patrons who'd remained in their seats began to give heed to the end of their entertainment, and the room erupted in applause. Turim could barely see through the smoke. He felt a hand take his, and the dancer appeared beside him. Curiously, she seemed to have rather strong forearms for one so fair, and her hands were calloused with work. He could just make her out, pointing down. Then he realized what they were standing over. It was a trap door. Quite abruptly, Meineken burst through the smoke, stopping just short of running into them. I'm in your tent, milady, said Turim gratefully. Clench up, she replied gently as Meineken, Turim, and the dancer dropped to the darkness below the stage, landing on a straw mattress with a thump. After a brief recovery, Turim pushed himself to his knees and looked around. They'd fallen through the wooden stage. Small cracks of light filtered down. The walls were rounded and made of hewn stone, and at one end was a wooden door. At the other end, the dark maw of a staircase opened downward. The girl rose quickly, beckoning the others to follow as she reached for the torch hanging in the sconce on the wall. She scraped it against a flint fixed next to the sconce. The flint slid across a piece of steel to produce a spark, and the flame of the torch danced to life. Turim's eyes widened in marvel at this simple device. He wondered why no one had thought of that before. There wasn't time to stare. The dancer entered the descending staircase, and they quickly made their way down the stairs as the darkness obeyed, displacing for firelight. There's trouble about you two, the dancer said, shaking her head. The Dark Knight's appearance here is rarer than the flight of bulls. But the danger they face is probably greater than their numbers can handle. She ran her fingers through her red hair, taking a small tie out from the back before she spoke again. Those rangers. How do you know them? I crossed paths with them in the wood near the cabin I was staying in, answered Turim cautiously. I hope they'll be unharmed. He was also concerned for the strangers left above to stand between their escape and the dark nights. <laughs> The rangers can look after themselves, replied the girl. And, as if she knew Term's other thoughts, she said, And don't worry about the occupants of the pub. Many are knights of the badger or warriors who fought against the dragon army in secrecy. They'll be all right. This helped put Term at ease. When he looked over, Meineken seemed unconcerned with anything but the descent of the stairs. He didn't look to be out of breath at all, either. Just another thing for him to do today. Turim assumed the girl who'd aided their escape was more likely ally than foe, but he remained wary of disclosing much of their tale to her just yet. What he did hope was that she'd be able to tell them where they could charter a ship or send a message. Without warning, however, Meineken spoke. We must return to Genova quickly. The Dragon Army will make an attack of epic proportions there. We have to warn our country of its peril. Before Turim could protest Meineken's rash words, their rescuer replied with a proud voice. Well, it appears you've fallen into a bit of luck then. I'm Sinfa Songbird, pilot of the Cloud Racer. Turim wondered what the Cloud Racer might be. A ship? More of a mechanical wonder. 
We call it an airship, replied Simpha, taking two steps at a time now. Turum was raised on a farm, and though the plow had been a useful tool, he didn't usually take to those who claimed to have created mechanical wonders. Still, he and his new companion were in need. He could at least let Simpha make her case for the contraption before declining any offer of help she might give. Finally, they reached the staircase's end. It was a good thing then that Uncle Critchard acted as fast as he did, said Simpha. He owns the Mint Hippogriff. He's been a bitter enemy of the Dragon Army for years. They now stood in a great cavern. From its ceiling, what Turum could see in the darkness, hung broad stalactites. They'd obviously come quite deep. The torch Simpha carried cast little light into the distance, but they could see a large wooden sailing ship with great propellers affixed to its masts. The craft appeared to sit on large rails, perhaps for stability when it landed? Turum and Minikin looked in wonder at the thing. They'd stopped for just a brief moment, however, when Simpha strode onward into the vast expanse of the cavern. I haven't flown her in a while, she said, but she's been my project since I was a child. Sort of a family project. It's a rare craft I dabble in. But come on, let's get going. I'm not sure how long it will be before the Dark Knights discover our trickery and follow down the staircase. Approaching the ship, she climbed the rope ladder draped down its side to its deck. Turum leaned closer to the ninja. Minakin, what craft have you gotten us allied with? He said softly. I would think she made it prime. This is what is called an airship. I told you we would find help here. Turum shook his head, watching Minakin approach the airship. Oh, come on. You had no more idea she'd be here than I did. He climbed the wooden rope ladder behind Minakin, swallowing hard. <laughs> Well, we need to send our message, milady," said Turum as he clambered up. I'm sure we can send a falcon? A messenger bird of some sort. Nope, she replied, still walking away. Our communication with anyone off the island has been locked down for over a year. Now you wait here. I need to go check the steam engine and get its fires hot. She went below deck briefly while Turum and Minikin waited topside. That's not good. Turum looked to Minikin. Do you know who could do such a thing? Ease is primarily controlled by a constable, if I remember right," said Minikin, his hand on his chin. I wonder if Ease's constable is connected with the Dragon Army. It doesn't matter now, said Minikin. We have no idea how many Dark Knights are after you, and the Dark Elves cannot be far behind. A message would need a great deal of explanation, and even if we'd found some other beast to fry us back, we'd be hurried by our enemy up until the moment we left. This girl is exactly what we need right now. When Simpha appeared again, she wore a red cap and a brown jumper, slightly stained with oily grime on the sleeves and knees. The legs of her attire were lined with several pockets, and she'd put on sturdy boots. Turum's surprise only continued. Simpha swiftly climbed the stairs to the helm, pulling a few large wooden levers. In moments, the propellers above them began to turn round. Turum rubbed his eyes to hide his growing astonishment. The wind from the propellers began to pick up speed now, and the ship rocked slightly as it tried to pull from the ground. Simpha wrenched another lever, and the chain that anchored the ship to the cavern floor detached. Inside the hull, they could hear a great cog turning as the mighty weight was reeled in. The cloud racer rose above the ground and moved forward bit by bit, slowly creeping down the long tunnel that led to the cavern exit. Now, I suggest you two hold on tight. The ride is going to be a bit rough. 